Season 1 of Game of Thrones parallels Book 1 very closely, and George R. R. Martin has said that the hints to the endgame can be found in Book 1. They can even be found in the very first episode, or rather, the canon behind the first episode. So here's some extra color. 14 things you should know before Season 8. In Episode 1, the White Walkers say hello, we meet the Starks, a man loses his head, they find a dead stag, a dead direwolf, and some cute little wolf pups. The Hand of the King is dead, so the king rides north. He arrives at Winterfell, pays respect to his betrothed, the late Lyanna Stark. There's a feast, John and Tyrion chat outside, Littlefinger's machinations begin. Danny's sold to a Dothraki warlord, they marry, the king goes hunting, Bran climbs, the Lannister or Targaryen twins do the horizontal tango, and the boy who never falls, falls. Some people never watched another episode, and others scrambled right into episode 2. But let's pause. There are major clues here relating to the endgame, specifically Arya, Cersei, Jaime, Tyrion, Bran, the Night King, Danny, and Jon Snow. Shall we begin? Number 1. Arya's Wedding. Scene 2 in the show starts out with Arya sewing. This is Arya's first chapter in the book. She feels alone because her sister Sansa is so pretty and so good at the lady stuff. Septimundane once told Kat that, quote, Arya has the hands of a blacksmith. Meaning... Arya's a tomboy, but this is a clear play on words, Arya eventually befriending a blacksmith. But will they ever find themselves sitting in a tree? K-I-S-S-I-N-G? Probably. I've never had a family. I can be your family. But that means Arya needs to survive the War for the Dawn, and I've got bad news for you. Number 2. Arya's Death Arya's got a Bravosi-style blade called Needle, a reference to how Arya hates sewing. Arya's very first chapter ends with Jon telling her this, quote, When the spring thaw comes, they will find your body with a needle still locked tight between your frozen fingers. Dun dun dun. So George was hedging here. Arya and Gendry will marry, or she will die, or maybe both. Die, get raised, I'm talking to you Mel, and then marry the blacksmith. You wouldn't be my family. You'd be my lady. Number three. John will have bastard children. John's a bastard. It's at the core of his identity. It's separated him from the Starks, mostly Sansa and Lady Cat, but also from society as a whole. People look at bastards as curses. Stannis' wife is a great example. She wanted Stannis to burn one of King Robert's bastards, Edric Storm or Gendry in the show, partially because she thought he was the reason that she never gave birth to a son. Insane, right? She thought this because he was a bastard, and bastards are curses. So check this out. The Winterfell Feast. In the show, John is outside because Lady Cat did not want to sit a bastard in the presence of royalty. In the books, John's allowed inside, but he has sat among young squires, not with his family. And because of that, John can get drunk. There's no one near him to stop him. The very first line of Jon Snow's very first chapter is probably important, right? Here it is, quote, There were times, not many, but a few, when Jon Snow was glad he was a bastard. And on top of that, Jon Snow's first chapter ends with the chat outside with Tyrion. Tyrion says, Let me give you some advice, bastard. Never forget what you are. The rest of the world will not wear it like armor. And it can never be used to hurt you. Jon Snow is a bastard. He becomes Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, even though he's a bastard. He became the king in the north, even though he's a bastard. If you think that Jon Snow is going to throw all that away by changing his name to Jon Stark or Jon Targaryen, you haven't been paying attention. Jon Snow will always be Jon Snow. I don't care if he's a bastard. Ned Stark's blood runs through his veins. He's my king, from this day until his last day. He is the White Wolf, the king in the north. And he won't get married to avoid having his own bastard. The dead are coming and the world is changing. The new world, the one that John and Danny are building together, will be a better one for their bastard children. Number four, the battle at Winterfell. There is a passageway that can take you all the way around Winterfell's walls, and only Bran knows about it. We might not see this in the show, but this secret tunnel will definitely pay off in the books. Number 5. Who will win the Game of Thrones? Who will be king when the snow melts? In Jon Snow's very first chapter, he looks at Jaime and thinks, quote, This is what a king should look like. So will we see King Jaime and Lady Bran as Maggie the Frog's younger, more beautiful queen? You will be queen. Then comes another younger, more beautiful to cast you down and take all you hold dear. Unlikely, but I'm pulling for it, and there's a lot of evidence. I'll make a detailed video on that. Hit subscribe. More likely, number six, King Tyrion. The very last line of Jon Snow's very first chapter is probably important too, right? Here it is, quote, When he opened the door, the light from within threw his shadow clear across the yard, and for just a moment, 
Tyrion Lannister stood tall as a king. All you Tyrion and Sansa shippers, that one's for you. King Tyrion and Queen Sansa. Number 7. Night Queen Cersei. I don't buy it, but check this out. At the feast, Jon notes that Cersei, quote, seemed as cold as an ice sculpture. There are a lot of references like this about her in the books. I'll collate them into a future video. So Cersei getting turned and allying with the Night King seems like a stretch, but it's still on the table. Number 8. A Stad killed a direwolf, foreshadowing bad events to come when Ned the direwolf followed his buddy Robert the Stag down to King's Landing and they both went down. Number 9. The White Walkers. Some fans think that the White Walkers let Will go so that he could warn the Night's Watch or tell people south of the wall. But in the books, Will climbs down a tree, picks up Waymar's shattered sword and thinks, the broken sword would be his proof. And then Sir Waymar rises from the dead and kills him. So the White Walkers did not let him go in the canon. It's the older dude who was watching the horses who ends up escaping. And there's no proof that the White Walkers let Garrod go per se. So take that for what it's worth in your own theory crafting. Number 10, The Night King. George R. R. Martin has said that there will be three big twists. The first was Shireen, the second was Hodor, and the third will probably be the Night King. Before Will was killed, he counted 12 wounds in Waymar, implying 12 White Walkers took a turn at slashing him. Later in the show, we see that the Night King has 12 buddies, and 12 people died at Danny's wedding, which was another Easter egg to the third big reveal. It's right in our faces. The Night King is the Night's King of History and Lore, the 13th Lord Commander, and possibly even the last hero, who had 12 companions. That's why we think that there are only eight White Walker generals remaining and all the rest of the kids are up in the lands of always winter. Number 11, the North does not remember. Later in the story, Bran asked Bloodraven, what must I learn? And Bloodraven said, everything. And in the books, Bran asked Jojen, what do the trees remember? And Jojen replied, truths, the first men knew, forgotten now in Winterfell. The Northerners use the term the North remembers quite often. Always related to vengeance though, to violence, to hate. When in all actuality, the phrase relates to something much bigger, the past, the far past, the White Walkers and the Night King. Will told them what's up, the White Walkers are back, but the Warden of the North, Ned Stark, did not believe him. Ned didn't believe that the White Walkers are back, in fact, Ned wondered if they ever existed in the first place. We all love Ned, but come on dude, you're no King of Winter, that's for sure. Meanwhile, Cat, a non-Northerner, was already fearing the White Walkers. So the North remembers, my ass. Number 12, Daenerys Targaryen, the fake Azor Ahai. We get several references to rubies and red priest in Danny's first two chapters, a sign that Illyrio was working with the faith of Rhaelor, and eventually Danny becomes their champion. Not the real Azor Ahai, that was her brother, Rhaegar, but Danny is the false Azor Ahai, the red fates prophesied Azor Ahai, a red herring. This explains why Illyrio gave her three priceless dragon eggs, because he was in cahoots with the Red Temple. The dragon eggs come from the Shadowlands beyond Ashai. It's where Melisandre learned to create shadow babies. It's where Miri Mazdor learned the dark magic that's used on Khal Drogo. It's probably where the Red Fates started. In other words, if you still think that the Lord of Light is good and White Walkers are bad, you haven't been paying attention. The Lord of Light isn't even real, and the religion is disgusting. It's all about black and white, my way or the highway, follow the Lord of Light or burn. Melisandre was sold to the temple as a child slave. Thoros was sold to the temple as a child slave. See this priest slave brand? All of them are brainwashed, but it gets tricky, because Danny is very anti-slavery. She's paving her own course, let's not sell her short. She believes in herself, not the fake Lord of Light. Do you know what kept me standing through all those years in exile? Faith, not in any gods, in myself. In Daenerys Targaryen. That was one of the best lines and concepts of all of season 7, the law of attraction. You go girl. But her actions are exactly what the faith wants. She came to Westeros, she's burning people that don't support her, and she's got her eyes on the Night King. She's the Red Faith's champion in a war of ice and fire, whether she realizes it or not. Are the Red Priests here to save the day from Team Ice? Or has Ice attacked because Mel came to Westeros and started burning down the weirwood trees? Good old chicken or the egg. Lucky number 13, the Crypts of Winterfell. The Starks lay swords across the laps of the Stark Lords, which means they're denying guest right down there. You should not be down there unless you're a Stark. It's also an ancient custom to keep the vengeful spirits in their crypts. But Iron Rust, the oldest swords with nothing more than red stains now, making Ned Stark wonder if the spirits are free to roam Winterfell. Dun dun dun. King Robert was pissed that they buried Lyanna down there, saying she deserved more than darkness. Anytime you see or hear the word darkness, step back and brainstorm because the goal of the story is to destroy the literal, and more importantly, the figurative darkness in people's lives, to bring forth the dawn of a new day, Lightbringer, all those beautiful metaphors. 
Robert was pissed that they buried Liana down there, and note that she is the only female buried in the crypts. Or is she? We'll get back to this in a sec. Number 14. This is big. Ned Stark asked Bran if he knew why he did it, why he swung the sword himself. The reason is because you should look a man in the eyes, hear his final words, and if you cannot bear to do that, then perhaps the man does not deserve to die. So far, this concept has never paid off. Every time someone looks someone in the eyes, they think, yep, he deserves to die, even the kids. Rickard Karstark, Jano Slynn, Bowen Marsh, Arthur Yawick, Sir Alistair Thorne, and Ollie. The man who swings the sword is a concept from Bran Stark's very first chapter, from the second scene in the show. So expect this to pay off in a big way. Maybe the Night King. If we get some vanilla John vs. the Night King sword fight, cool, it'd be badass, but we might get something epic, something to make us cry, something to make us go, whoa. So here's the tinfoil as of February 7th. The North does not remember. The White Walkers were real and they're back. The Night King's attacking and Danny, the prophesized Azor Ahai, is fighting back. A song of ice and fire. It's going to be bittersweet. People we love will die, even Arya. Then Melisandre will give up her own life fire to raise Arya from the dead. And Arya will find the true Arya inside the shell that she has become. Once she has the hands of her blacksmith, her Lightbringer. Once she finds the oldest and strongest power in this world, love, her darkness will subside. In case you forgot, the North still does not remember. They've seen the Night King, but they have no idea who he is, when he was turned, and why he was turned. Was he the first White Walker, or did he kill the first King of Winter? This is on you in Season 8, Bran. Stop creeping on Sansa and go figure it out. Robert's Rebellion was built on a lie, and Bran will find out that many of the songs of history and lore are also lies, written by the winning side. The Night King was a bastard. He became Lord Commander of the Night's Watch and fell in love with another, a woman beyond the wall. How dare he? How dare he fall in love? What a scumbag. Oh wait, that sounds kind of like... Maybe the Night King's name is Jon Snow. There's some evidence, check out that video. He became the Lord Commander, fell in love, declared himself king and his wife his queen. Then his half-brother, Brandon Stark, King of the North, tried to kill him, and he did kill his lover, the Night Queen. He imprisoned her in the Winterfell crypts, but the iron has rusted. Her spirit is back, but she's trapped inside the magical walls of Winterfell. The Night King is pissed. In advance of the War for the Dawn, Azor Ahai was born at the tragedy of Summerhall, Rhaegar Targaryen. Rhaegar was fire, Lyanna was ice. People are swords, and they are fueled by life fire. So people are fiery swords. Rhaegar plunged his bloody sword into Lyanna, Nisa Nisa, creating a new fiery sword, Lightbringer, Jon Snow. A young man whose song parallels that of the Night King. So when he looks into the Night King's eyes, will he swing that sword? Or will we finally get a payoff from Brandon Stark's very first chapter? So that's the story. Thousands of years ago, man brought war to the children of the forest. The children of the forest created the White Walkers. Now the White Walkers are bringing war back to man. John and Danny are the new heroes, embracing the oldest and strongest power out there, love. They're creating a new and better world for their bastard children. The story began with the children, and it will end with the children. Everything coming full circle. Tyrion will probably be king, Sansa queen, but it'd be pretty poetic if Jaime Targaryen, Kinslayer Kingslayer, becomes a Kinslayer Queenslayer, saving King's Landing over a million people from wildfire again. But this time, the man who jokingly sat on the Iron Throne already, the man who avoided power over and over, will be forced to take the seat on back of his selfless deeds because he's going to be the people's champ. By his side will be his own fiery sword, his own light bringer, the woman who inspired him and helped him fill out the remaining pages of the Book of Brothers with good deeds. None other than the Hound with Teats, Brienne the Beauty, Lady Brienne.